When I look at cardiovascular outcomes trials, I try to think about, okay, look at them individually. As I said, look at them scientifically. There would be FDA approval. FDA approval process will proceed as it always does. What does this mean for my patients? Which patients do I need to get on these medications? So let's talk about a patient with cardiovascular disease who comes in here and their A1C is great, but they've got heart failure or they've had significant cardiovascular disease. I should be considering an SGLT2 inhibitor. Obviously, empagliflozin is the one that's approved right now in the United States for that. I should be thinking about trying to get my patient, assuming renal function is okay and they can tolerate the medication, on empagliflozin. Because the cardiovascular risk reduction doesn't have anything to do with hemoglobin A1C. It's outside A1C lowering, and the indication is outside A1C lowering. So I feel an obligation to get my patients on this because if you look at the data, if you've got a bunch of patients in your practice with cardiovascular disease and diabetes, type 2 diabetes, if you put them all on empagliflozin just according to the clinical trial data, you have to treat 49 of them to save one life in three years. Not that, that's not 10 years, that's not 15 years. That means in the next three years, you've saved at least one life. Say you've got 150 of those patients, that's three people who are still walking around. So these drugs need to be available to our patients. Um, We'll see you know, what indications we get as these other trials are submitted. We now have an indication for liraglutide. Should I be thinking about how I get my patient on liraglutide who has type 2 diabetes to lower their risk? If I put myself in the patient's seat, and I'm a pretty sick guy and I've got a lot of cardiovascular disease and diabetes, I'm going to be asking my provider, why can't I get on these? So we need to make sure that they're available. The other thing that's going to be important to see is there's a trial called Carolina coming up that hopefully will report out maybe in 2018, I'm not sure exactly, and it is linagliptin, which is a DPP-4 inhibitor. We've all seen that they're neutral. It's gonna be neutral, but it's versus glimepiride, a sulfonuria. What if, for the first time, we see that a sulfonuria is associated with increased cardiovascular risk? Are you gonna make my patient with type 2 diabetes fail the less expensive medicine that has more, that has worse outcomes before I can get the more expensive, newer medicine that actually has cardiovascular prevention. Those are the questions I think people need to struggle with. And I think the other part that I like to say is when you talk about cost of medications, we need to think beyond the cost of the medication at the pharmacy window. Yes, glamepiride is inexpensive. How much does it cost to have hypoglycemia and a hip fracture? Or like my patient who got hypoglycemia, given it to it from another provider who got lightheaded one night, fell and had intracerebral bleed and was in the hospital for seven days because of an episode of hypoglycemia. There are costs to the side effect profiles of some of these agents. So I think payers, managed care companies, need to think carefully about looking at global costs and what's best for these patients as we move forward. I think the real question is, what does the future look like in terms of how these cardiovascular outcomes trials affect decision making, how we treat patients? I think this is a huge paradigm shift. And one of the questions we don't have answered, probably are never going to have answered, is okay, these SGLT2 inhibitors that showed benefit, the GLP-1 receptor acts that showed benefit, perhaps the future ones that are going to show benefit as well, all in cardiovascular patients, all in patients rich with cardiovascular disease. What does that say about my selection for the 45-year-old who comes in my office, new to diabetes, needs something other than metformin? Because you're never gonna show a primary benefit. Nobody's gonna enroll in a trial for 20 years, stay there long enough to see if primary prevention actually works. And by the time you do that, all these manufacturers who'd be spending that kind of money are gonna be generic anyway. I think it's a really important question. So I go back to what do I like to think about more than just glycemic lowering. If I've got an agent that seems to have some sort of renal protection with it in terms of the SGLT2 class, and we seem to find that that's a benefit, and it has cardiovascular risk reduction in patients with cardiovascular disease, and it lowers blood pressure, and it lowers weight, why would I not take just that little glim leap of faith to say this is probably going to be cardiovascular protection for all of my patients with type 2 diabetes. You're never going to get that indication. You're never going to see that written anywhere because no one's going to do the trial. But most of us who have seen these results, as we see them coming in, are thinking there are much better choices for our patients, regardless of whether they have cardiovascular disease or don't. It's why at the top of the ACE algorithm after metformin, you got GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors as your number one and two choices after metformin. There's a reason for it. The classic CV outcomes trials as a whole 
are kind of wrapping up in the next two to three years because, unless I'm wrong, we don't have a brand new class of medications coming in. Uh, you'll have a couple of new SGLT2 inhibitors. They may do cardiovascular outcomes trials. They may not, especially if everybody thinks it's a class effect. The real question is, in 2008, the FDA insisted that all new pay drugs for diabetes prove cardiovascular safety based upon a failed meta-analysis by Nissen out of the Cleveland Clinic. Turned out he was absolutely wrong, just like we said he was absolutely wrong. And now you're going to continue to make companies bringing new agents do these studies. You know, this goes back to the consumer. You know, these are expensive trials to do. These are publicly traded companies. They have a responsibility to their shareholders. So what do you think this is doing to the cost of medications? You haven't seen one trial yet that showed glaring danger. Yes, there was in the DPP-4 inhibitor some small increase in hospitalization for heart failure, which most of us are kind of questioning, is that a real effect or not? Do we continue to insist that companies do this? Or do we let companies make the business decision of doing it on their own? I would urge the FDA to knock it off. I would urge them to say, as we've wrapped this up over a 10 and 12 year period of time, the amount of money and expense chasing our tails with this should be done. And that we should let companies decide if they want to spend the money on these and not be mandated by the federal government. Some of the trials I'd like to see going forward are already going on. For example, studies looking at empagliflozin, canagliflozin in heart failure. And that's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, with reduced ejection fraction, with diabetes, without diabetes. How about renal outcomes, Credence trial with canagliflozin, and empagliflozin is doing renal outcomes trials in patients with chronic kidney disease. Are we gonna see for the first time in the next couple of years that these agents are gonna be the first in 25 years since ACEs and ARBs have been shown to actually slow the progression of renal disease in patients with type 2 diabetes. These are the trials I want to see, heart fail trials, where that's the primary outcome, renal protection trials, where that's the primary outcome, where we can actually get on our soapboxes and talk about it in a very broad sense with the community that takes care of our patients.